You read it once, you read it twice, you read it for the third time, this time even slower. But no matter how much you try, you just can't understand what the theorem is telling you. Then you remember that everybody says that this is a great book to learn poinsett topology, or functional analysis, or abstract algebra for the very first time. The book must be good, right? Otherwise, people would not be suggesting it. So probably you are the one who's just not good enough to understand it. Well, I don't think you are the problem. I think the books are the problem. And in this video, we'll learn a little bit of poinsett topology the wrong way. And right after that, the right way. And you'll be the judge of whether this that I'm about to show you is the better method or not. So let's get started. Topology by James R. Munkers. This is one of the most classic and widely known books in poinsett topology. Let's read Theorem 17.5 and tell me sincerely whether you understand it or not. Let A be a subset of the topological space X. Then X belongs to the closure of A if and only if every open set U containing X intersects A. Supposing the topology of X is given by a basis, then X belongs to the closure of A if and only if every basis element B containing X intersects A. And this is the proof. If you want, pause the video and read it. If you never studied poinsett topology before, most likely you had a hard time trying to understand what this theorem is all about. If you have already studied poinsett topology before, please try to remember the very first time when you were learning these concepts. I'm pretty sure that most of you would not have fully understood what we just read. Now, a good question would be, what are the prerequisites for studying this book? Let's see what it says. There are no formal subject matter prerequisites for studying most of this book. Unless the reader has studied a bit of analysis or rigorous calculus, much of the motivation for the concepts introduced in the first part of the book will be missing. Things will go more smoothly if he or she already has had some experience with continuous functions, open and closed sets, metric spaces, and the like. Okay, to be fair, when it comes to the first chapter, I would say that he does put in more effort than math books usually would to build a foundation. Although it is still far from good, a beginner will definitely have a very hard time trying to digest the content. And another problem is that, after building the foundation, the book goes straight into the rigor of the concepts which are completely new to the reader, without building any intuition. We meet the classic wall of definitions, theorems, and proofs not to mention the classic problem of exercises without any solutions. Of course, the author defines all the terms here in previous pages, as part of that wall of definitions, but they do not build any intuition. There's no motivation for why they matter. You would have probably taken a very, very long time to properly digest all the theorems, and would have probably just gone on without completely understanding them. I also want to say that this is not a personal criticism to the author. Not at all. From a rigorous point of view, the book is amazing. As far as rigor is concerned, it is very beginner-friendly. It does define most things, and it is very complete. But learning math is more than just rigor. It requires building intuition first and showing a bunch of concrete examples, and only then introducing these concepts in a formal way. So all I'm saying is that I think we can do a better job than that. We can publish better math books than we currently do. Now, let's study the theorem, but the right way this time. Before even introducing the theorem, we need to answer the following question. What is its intent? What is the motivation behind it? Our goal is to understand when a point X is in the closure of a set A in a topological space X. The closure of A includes all points that are either in A or are limit points of A meaning that you can't get arbitrarily close to it without bumping into A. So intuitively, what the first part of the theorem says is that if you can't create an open neighborhood around a point X that avoids intersecting A, then X is not close enough to A, and therefore X does not belong to the closure of A. On the other hand, if every open set or neighborhood U around a point X, no matter how small you make it, still intersects A somewhere, then X is close enough to A, and we say that X belongs to the closure of A. Let's see a concrete example. The topological space X will be the two torus, which can be described as the unit square 0, 1 squared, where opposite edges are identified. 
Let A be an open disk of radius 0.2 centered at 0 0.4, 0 0.6. Now we choose a point X with coordinates 0 0.6, 0 0.6. And we check whether it's part of the closure of A or not. Let's pick a neighborhood U1 around X, defined as a square with coordinates 0 0.5, 0 0.7, and same thing for the other side. As you can see, the intersection of U1 with A is non-empty. Now, pick a smaller neighborhood U2 around X, defined as a rectangle 0 0.59, 0 0.7, and the other side just as before. We still have that U2 intersection with A is non-empty. Of course, it is easy to convince ourselves that no matter how small the neighborhood U is, we always get that the intersection between U and A is non-empty. However, technically, if we want to use the result of point A of this theorem, we need to show that for every neighborhood U around X, and not only rectangular ones, but all possible shapes of open sets, which is kind of impractical. And that's why we have point B of the theorem. First, we must define what a basis for a topology is. Let's make an analogy from linear algebra. Imagine a 2D plane inside a three-dimensional space, like the XY plane in R3. This plane contains infinitely many vectors, but if you want to check whether some vector v in R3 is parallel to the plane, do you need to test it against every single vector in the plane? No, you only need to check whether v lies in the span of just two basis vectors, say e1 and e2. And if it is a linear combination of those two, then it lies in the plane. In an analogous way, in a topological space, there are infinitely many open sets. But some properties can be checked only against basis elements for a topology, and they will be automatically true for every open set in the space. A basis for a topology is a collection of open sets that we use to build all other open sets via unions. The essence of point B in the theorem is that if every basis element around a point intersects A, then every open set around that point, which is built from those basis elements, will also intersect A. If you guys are enjoying the video, please do not forget to like it and to subscribe to the channel. Also, if you want to support our work, consider becoming a member of the channel. Thanks for that. Going back to our example, we can use the standard basis for the two torus. These are open rectangles, as you can see. Take X just as before. In order for a basis element B to contain X, it must satisfy these four inequalities. In particular, any such rectangle must have A less than 0.6. But all points in the set A have first coordinate less than 0.6 as well, so they always overlap, and as a consequence, X must belong to the closure of A. Try to reread the rigorous theorem and its proof now. I'm sure that you will find it to be way easier than before. I mean, I'm pretty sure that the author himself could have done a better job than me in explaining this theorem in an intuitive way. The reason why he and most math authors don't is honestly a mystery to me. Look, I'm not trying to flex here. I'm just trying to say that there's a lot of content on the internet, including other YouTube channels, that do a much better job at explaining advanced math topics than like 99% of books nowadays. This is just a fact. The proper way of learning not only point set topology, but any math, is first, to build intuition, then to see a bunch of concrete examples, third, rigor, and fourth, practice with exercise, which this book thankfully provides, but of course, with no solutions, so you can't really know if you solved it correctly. Classic. Now imagine learning all the theorems, proofs, and results in your favorite books the same way we studied this theorem here today. Wouldn't it make your life much easier? I'm not saying you cannot learn from these books. Of course you're gonna learn from them. I mean, it wouldn't make any sense because all the professors and researchers nowadays, they learned from these books, right? But I'm just saying that they are not optimal from the pedagogical point of view. Spitting out definitions and theorems and proofs without building intuition first, in my opinion, is just lazy. Mathematicians can do better than that, and they could take more time on explaining these subjects in more details. But instead, they put all the work on the reader, 
It's already hard enough to try and learn new things in math, but it is much harder when you have to like decipher this wall of definitions and theorems without this deep intuitive explanation. You know, Henry Ford didn't invent the car, but he was the one who made it affordable and accessible to the masses. There's a well-known quote, which is often repeated in tech and innovation circles, and it's usually misattributed to him. If I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Whether he said it or not, it's not really the point, but try to understand the idea behind it. People tend to think in terms of what they already know, not in terms of what's possible. Nobody was imagining a world without horses. They just wanted to improve the things they already had, because that's what they were used to. People rarely ask for change, even when changing is like the most optimal option. And honestly, higher math education has been stuck in the same place for decades. This rigid format of definitions, theorems, proof, repeat over and over again, without ever building intuition first, has become so normalized that people can't even imagine a world without it. They can't imagine learning math in any different way. It's robotic, but it doesn't have to be this way. The point that I'm trying to get across is that in general, we can write better math books. We can design learning experiences that are deeper, faster, and way more human. Especially now that we have all of these tools like AI, YouTube, online forums, visualization softwares, or interactive platforms and so on. We don't need to keep dragging people to the same old path of learning used decades ago. And all of this because we just don't want to innovate. Change doesn't happen by accident. It requires a conscious effort. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with this YouTube channel. If you want to study all the explanations we saw in this video in detail, check out the PDF link in the description. It's completely free. Now, if you want to learn how to build mathematical intuition, check out this video in the channel. See you guys there.